Here we are, final position preview, and you know we had to save the best for last. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball Today. Frank, Scott, and Chris all here on Thursday, February 22nd. Today on the show, Chris's favorite relief pitcher preview. We'll take a look at the state of saves, try and predict each team's closer, ADP, sleepers, breakouts, busts, sparps, and everything in between. But first... We have actual baseball today. The Dodgers are taking on the Padres. 3 p.m. Eastern time, first spring training game. Gavin Stone versus Joe Musgrove. Michael King will follow Musgrove in that game. Uh, before we actually talk about relievers, what do you guys pay attention to during spring training? Well, that's a good question. I, I just wrote about this for the Fantasy Baseball Today newsletter, cbssports.com slash newsletter slash fantasy baseball today, but you won't get that one you'll just get the ones after you subscribe but you can go to cbssports.com and read about it as well because i believe it's up there and i think there are six things that we watch out for primarily in roughly descending order of importance injuries velocity readings new pitches lineup news position battles and prospects gaining hype those are i, I think you could probably argue that prospects gaining hype should be a little higher but that's also kind of position battle, so I, I think it's fine to put at the bottom. But yeah, tomorrow, I, I want to see Joe Musgrove pitch and, and look healthy after all the arm issues last season and, and make sure that his velocity is where it needs to be. And it's easy to overreact to velocity being up or down. I think we can look at Chris Bassett last spring and also Reed Detmers last spring on two ends, opposite ends of the spectrum. Reed Detmer's velocity was up. Turns out it didn't really matter. Chris Bassett's velocity was way down. Turns out it really didn't matter. And so that the thing to keep in mind when you're freaking out about velocity is it's, it's just a snapshot in time. It's how hard they are throwing right now. It doesn't necessarily mean they will continue throwing that hard when the regular season starts. It also doesn't necessarily mean they will be good or bad. There is a correlation between effectiveness and velocity, but it's, not a perfect one. So I think that's the most tangible thing you're looking for in real spring training games. Like performance, I, I don't really care very much about. Uh, but yeah, I, I, those are those are the six things I'm looking for. I would sum up and you know basically agree with Chris's thoughts, but I would sum up what I look at at spring training as what are what are people saying? who are involved with the team and what are beat writers writing about. I mean, if, if there is, if there is a major development in terms of velocity or in terms of um, if there is, if there is a performance that could potentially be meaningful, you, you can trust it will be written about. Like, I feel like this is the time of year when baseball news um, in, in terms of playing fantasy, when baseball news is the most important mm -hmm. And it can take a long time to pour over <laughs> the news for every team. But fortunately, you don't have to do that. Chris and I will have uh, twice a week, beginning next week. And Chris has already come out with a couple of them. But twice a week, beginning next week, uh, we will have spring training roundup articles, which, again, isn't going to focus so much on performance. Mm -hmm. There might be. There might be a time when a pitching performance or even a hitting performance launches us into um, into a bigger issue that's going on with that player. But you can trust that we have reviewed the news and have picked out the most important, the juiciest tidbits. I mean, one of them, gosh, I can think back. I, I've been doing this for a few years. Thankfully, Chris is going to make it so the articles can come out more often now. But a couple of juicy tidbits I remember in the past, I mean, the year Shohei Otani became a true everyday player, very few people seem to be clued into that. It, and it was something I read early in spring training from Joe Madden. And, um, and it ended up being a total game changer. It turned him into a perennial MVP candidate. So that's just one example of the kinds of things you can mind for in spring training. Remember a couple years ago, we got huge breakouts from Carlos Rodon, Trevor Rogers, uh, and who else? Somebody, somebody else. I think Robbie Ray. Robbie Ray, who went on to win the Cy Young. Yeah, and 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 those were, those were players I had no interest in going into spring training, and then all of them skyrocketed because of things that were being reported in spring training. So I, it's 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 definitely worth paying attention to. Of course, you can overreact to it. You can uh, end up inflating players' value because of it. 
but if if you're careful not to do that and you're you're treating it more uh as you know a way to find late round sleepers and such then i think it's i think there's very valuable stuff to find there all right, let's get into relief pitchers, the state of saves, and we will talk about strategy in all of the different types of formats. But first, famous last words, but 2023 was a great year for closers in fantasy. Uh, last year, we had 12 relievers with 30-plus saves. That was the most since 2016. We had 23 relievers with 20-plus saves, the most since 2017. To put that in perspective, in 2022, there were 10 with 30-plus 18 with 20 plus, and then in 2021, nine with 30 plus, 19 with 20 plus. So I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers your way. What you need to know is that last year was very good for saves and for closers. But something that Chris has pointed out a lot throughout these position previews is just because something happened last year doesn't mean it will be that way in 2024. With that being said, uh, Scott, we'll start with you. What are your thoughts on closers and the state of saves in fantasy? Well, obviously, I feel great about it compared to recent years, uh, and it, it was it was a re, it was a surprising reversal of trend because it seemed like the league was trending more and more to the leverage, the high leverage reliever, saving their best reliever for the highest leverage situation, whether it was the ninth inning or not. Uh, closer committee, you could have described it that way. Just unpredictable save distributions and. Um, and too too much, just too many too many cooks in the kitchen as far as saves were concerned, and that was elevating the true closers to ridiculous prices, especially the especially in like some of those fifteen team roto leagues. We were seeing the top closers go as early as round two last year. But I don't know exactly what happened. Maybe it was just a blip. It was almost like managers around the league collectively grew exhausted with the with the the high leverage reliever approach. I mean, the two managers who were most consistently opposed to having a set closer, Rocco Baldelli of the Twins and Kevin Cash of the Rays, even they got in on having a true closer. Their their bullpen habits became very predictable all of a sudden with Johan Duran taking over as the closer for the Twins and um, uh, Pete Pete Fairbanks Pete taking Fairbanks. over for the Rays. Pete Fairbanks' save total isn't huge because he went on the IL sometimes, but even then, very consistently, it was Jason Adam who filled in for mm -hmm. him. Uh, so, it, so now we're going in, and instead of half the teams, or I think even at this time last year, it was fewer than half the teams, had a set closer. Now it's like two thirds of the league at least has a set closer. And I would say as many as like 24, 25 teams who, even if there's some seed of doubt there about who the closer is going in, you feel pretty confident, you know, who the closer is going in. And um, so, I, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think, I don't think you have to approach this position with the same, desperation you may have felt like you had to the past couple of years. There's just no need for that. Some of these guys are going to lose their job. Of course, that always happens. But honestly, even, even the, even the relievers who we do think are set in the role right now, it's because they genuinely deserve it. They are like clearly the best reliever on their own teams. It's, there's, there's not even, there aren't even many situations out there where it's like, yeah, this guy's the closer for now, but we know so-and-so is better. And there aren't even many of those situations. So it's, it's really a good time to, uh, to, to, to get back to the old standard in fantasy of not paying for saves. All right, let's talk strategy in each type of format, and we will start with the standard 5x5 five five Roto where you have nine pitcher spots that you can divvy up however you'd like. It, most people, I think, go six starting pitchers, three relievers, seven starting pitchers, two relievers, and I think later on in the season, it'll change depending on what your team needs. If you need more wins and more strikeouts, then you'll probably lean on more starters, if you need saves, then obviously you'll get more closers in your lineup. Uh, Chris, your thoughts on standard 5x5 five five Roto strategy. Yeah, so last year, the average first place team in saves had 91 saves. The average uh, fourth place team had 71. So to be in third place, you needed 72 on average. So uh, I think you probably just want, if you're going to draft closers, you probably only need two. 
Now, the thing about that is there is still a lot of attrition at the closer position. You look at last year's saves, and of those 12 pitchers who got to 30 saves last year, I think probably three of them are probably not going to be closers this year. I think the bottom three, Felix Bautista, Ryan Presley, and Carlos Estevez. Carlos Estevez actually... Yeah, they've he's, he's given, one of those. He's one of those who's clearly not. Yeah, yeah but he's, he's one of those who's clearly not the best reliever in his own bullpen. Yeah, but yeah, we don't expect him to necessarily remain the closer the whole season. So, yeah, there's still a, a fair degree of attrition and turnover at this position, especially among you know more like the bottom fifteen closers, I guess. So, you can't necessarily just draft two closers and and think that you're good for the rest of the season unless you want to pay up for them, which I think is still a an okay strategy and one that I've done a few times in mock drafts. And, you know, I don't necessarily mind doing that. It's well, if you're paying you, up, I, th I feel like there's less reason to get a third closer. No, I that's that's what I'm saying. You just okay. if you're if you're drafting like two legitimate closers, I think that's all you should do. And if you're drafting, if you're not going to do that, then that's where you you need to take more bites at the apple in the later rounds. And then so some like, of these some ahead. of these closers are so cheap though, like Jose Leclerc. I, I understand part of the reason they're cheap is because we're not confident. Yeah. We're not totally confident they're going to be the guy, but you can get Jose Leclerc so late. You could get either of the Padres guys so late. Uh you could get at you get Jose Alvarado, who could be a stud closer mm -hmm. for the Phillies if he seizes that job. You can get him very late. In shallower leagues, you can even get guys like Tanner Scott and Craig Kimbrell mm -hmm. very late. So um, I find I find I'm more often than not in Roto Leagues drafting a third closer because worst case scenario, you're going to run away with the saves category. And, and mm -hmm. nothing wrong with an extra 12 points or, or however many teams are in your league. Uh, how many yeah. points that I get you? Yeah, I mean, typically... I've had the same closer strategy in, in Roto Leagues the past five years, and... I, Honestly, I, I never really have too much trouble with it. I'm not not just trying to like talk myself up, but it's I usually try to get one of like the top 10 guys in ADP this year. I think it's more like a top nine that I feel really good about. Uh, don't shop at the top. I usually get one of like Iglesias, Romano, or David Bednar, and then try and get another solid RP2, a solid cl uh, second closer, Craig Kimbrell, uh, Kenley Jansen, maybe a Clay Holmes, someone like that. Mm -hmm. They obviously have some warts. They're not perfect. And then grab some spec guys later on, like the names that Scott brought up, like some of the Padres guys, maybe some of the Phillies or uh, some of the Rangers, like a Leclerc or a or David Robertson, whatever it might be. And I don't know that that's worked out well for me. And, and so I don't I don't see myself moving away from that strategy at this point. What about in head to head categories with standard five by five uh, categories as well? We'll talk about saves and holds in, in just a little bit. But the typical lineup here, two starting pitchers, two relievers and just four pitcher spots. I, I believe that's like the standard on Yahoo as well, which is most of like the head-to-head -head daily lineup, uh, daily category leagues. Uh, Scott, what are, your, what are your thoughts on that type of format, head-to-head -head categories? Well, this is of the three major formats. This is the one I'm, I'm least experienced in, though I have won the podcast for the People League two of the last three years. That is a saves plus hold format, I will point out. Um, I would say you need to lean even more into getting saves than you would in a Roto League. It's obviously more similar between those formats than between head-to-head -head points and head-to-head -head categories because it's its own category. But in head-to-head -head categories leagues, you can adjust how many closers you put in your lineup depending on what your opponent is doing. Mm -hmm. I also think head-to-head -head categories leagues are more commonly where you have daily lineups. And so yep. if you have more relievers, you can insert them in between your starts and they can help pad your stats that way. Um, and, and so you might even do that with non-closers. Uh, just having the option of choosing how hard you're going to go after closers every week or every day if it's a daily format is, is a nice luxury to have so i think i'd be even more likely to draft a third closer if not a fourth closer in a head-to-head -head categories format all right next up we have head-to-head -head points leagues where typically the top tier closers do not score as much based on the cbs scoring system for example devin williams was the top reliever last year 
and his point total was equivalent to SP 18 mm-hmm. in the same format. So uh, we also have Sparps. Those are starting pitchers who have relief pitcher eligibility uh, and kind of a cheat code um, in head-to-head points leagues. Chris, your thoughts on what to do in that format? Well, I just did a uh, – we just did a head-to-head salary cap draft, and I probably overdid it on Sparps, but this is a good year for Sparps. I mean – Obviously, we have Cole Reagans, who we all like as like a top 25 starting pitcher who's RP eligible. But there are, I mean, really, I think in your typical head-to-head, even a 12-team head-to-head points league, which is a relatively shallow league, I think there are probably six starting pitchers as relief pitchers who are worth drafting. And and then I drafted like three who I think most of us probably don't think are relief or, or worth drafting. But that was... um. I think it was an interesting strategy that I went with. I, I gra- drafted uh, Chris Paddock. I'm trying to remember. I can't pull it up right now. But Chris Paddock, Frankie Montas, uh, Sean Manaya. Uh, but some of the other ones are Michael King is a Sparp, Nick Pavetta, mm-hmm. Ryan Pepio. There are probably like eight to ten relief pitcher eligible players who look like they're going to open the season in a rotation, which – makes play paying for actual relief pitchers in a head to head points league. I think an even worse idea than normal. Now, a lot of these guys are pretty fringy or, or have really significant question marks. So like Frankie Montas may just not work out and you'll want a, an actual relief pitcher there, but head to head points leagues, I think in general are the le- the leagues where you want to pay up for relief pitchers the least. And I think that's especially true when there are, a lot of relief pitchers as spark uh, as starting pitchers who will have two start weeks that are you're just always going to start them when they have two starts and you're you're not really worried about them wrecking your ratios so yeah, yeah i think in head to head points leagues relief pitchers are even less valuable this year than normal i i was more into the sparp thing starting pitcher as relief pitcher back when it was a sneaky thing that you could pull Pull over on your league where, okay, I'm going to draft Carlos Carrasco. At one point in time, he was a spark. I'm going to draft him in round four so that I can stick him in my relief pitcher spot and outscore all those closers you're spending on. But it's not sneaky anymore. I mean, everybody knows sparks. I, I think it's, I think the pendulum has swung so far the other way that those guys are now, we're reaching for them beyond their ability level. Like, I don't have a problem with grabbing a Frankie Montas or Chris Paddock with my last pick just in case it works out. I mean, that's, that's a low risk uh, proposition, but they they tend to go earlier in that, at least in the ones we do in house. And uh, I, because of that, the true closers who are safer bets Mm -hmm. to deliver quality fantasy production fall even more like there, there's already considering each team in a head to head points league can normally only start two relievers. There are already more than enough to go around even before you add the sparps in. So I've, I've kind of said this consistently about head to head points leagues. Ideally I'm waiting till the last two rounds to fill my two relief mm-hmm. pitcher spots. Cause I can usually get a decent enough closer, maybe a low end spark, whatever it, it I'll be fine. Uh, as the, as that attrition is kicking in during the year, as that turnover is happening, new options are emerging on the waiver wire that people aren't that, aren't gravitating toward that hard because there's only so many relief pitcher spots to be filled out across the league. So yeah, I, I take it to an extreme when, when we say that head to head points is the format where you invest the least in reliever. And especially now that the closer ranks appear so much deeper, I think there's all the more reason to wait literally until your last two picks. If, if you can stand it. And even in a fairly active 12 team points league, there are going to be some closers on the waiver wire most of the year. Mm-hmm. You know, you're like you're you're probably not going to get stuck starting someone completely worthless. That that can ha- that'll happen in your roto leagues, and, and yep. that's where I think non closer relievers, even in regular saves leagues, have some value. But I think in head to head points, it just doesn't really make sense to pay up for even very very good closers. Yeah, I agree completely. I think specifically in this format, at this position, 
I'm going to go with the NERPS strategy. No intentional relief pitcher strategy. Shout out to Heath Cummings. A couple of their Sparps worth mentioning. Maybe not. But I'll just throw their names out there anyway. They're not very good. I mean, look, I drafted a bunch of these guys, so. Uh, you mentioned a, a lot of them already, Chris. Cole Reagans, Michael King, Nick, Nick Pavetta, Ryan Pepio, Chris Paddock, Frankie Montas. And then we get into D.L. Hall, who looks like he'll be in the Brewers rotation. There's Zach Littell, who we got a note uh, earlier in the week that he will be in the Rays rotation all year, or at least that, that's what they hope. Uh, Sean Benaya with the Mets, Alex Wood with the A's, uh, uh, Jordan Hicks, who... All three of these names, four yeah. of these names, are relievers who ex are expected to be stretched out as starters. Jordan yeah. Hicks with the Giants, Ronaldo Lopez with the Braves, AJ Puck with the Marlins, and Garrett Crochet with the White Sox. So, just uh, so expectations should be pretty low on all of them. Yes. Um, Jordan Pepe Hicks. Up. Last time. Pepe open up need to be drafted in every. every no, 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 no. I, I'm referring to the specifically the guys who were actual relief pitchers being okay. stretched out. The, Okay. They all pretty much have significant injury histories. Um, Jordan Hicks, I think, tried to be a starter in 2021. I think he made it through seven starts, had an elbow issue, and was moved right back to the bullpen. Mm -hmm. I think he walked like 22 and 24 innings. or uh, so I, I don't know what the exact number was, but it was a really bad number. So, yeah, that's uh, – expectations should be fairly low for those guys. But – I. I think all of them have some interesting things about them, certainly. Of those last four, Hicks, Rinaldo Lopez, AJ Puck, Garrett Crochet, the only one I actually expect to begin in the rotation is Jordan Hicks. I think the other teams have options well, that are at least as interesting, if not more interesting. The Giants are already down at least one starter uh, during spring, right? Yeah, I think Tristan Beck is yeah. dealing with an injury, so that's something to watch. I think with the Marlins, with what's going on with Braxton Garrett, there has been some talk that they could go to a six-man rotation at times. Mm -hmm. AJ Puck definitely could factor in there. So he's a name to watch. But again, no expectations on, on any of those guys, really. Before we take our first break, just a few quick things to promote. The FBT newsletter. Make sure to sign up, cbssports.com slash newsletters. You can scan the QR code if you're watching on YouTube. Chris does a great job. He sent out a bunch of position previews, but now we're getting into different types of articles and those spring training updates. So make sure to sign up uh, and you'll get all those things delivered right to your inbox for free. And my favorite players to draft in every round coming out tomorrow morning. Let's go. If you're watching live, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. If you aren't watching live, what are you waiting for? What are you doing? YouTube.com slash fantasy baseball today. March is quickly approaching. It's going to be a very busy month. We've got live mock drafts coming up, rankings, updates, spring training thoughts, and much more. So make sure to subscribe, youtube.com slash fantasy baseball today. We'll take our first break. When we return, some quick thoughts on saves plus holds right after this. The Scudetto, where the soul of Italy meets the pinnacle of Calcio. Catch Serie A on CBS Sports Network and streaming live on Paramount+. Plus. Welcome back in. Let's talk about saves plus holds or just holds in general because they have grown wildly in popularity in fantasy leagues every year or even today when I tweeted out this relief pitcher preview, we got some responses. Hey, make sure you talk about holds. So people are excited about it. Uh, and I do think it's interesting for fantasy because instead of worrying about role, you can legitimately just draft the most skilled relievers, right? Because... You know, even whatever, any type of reliever, if he's pitching the seventh, eighth, ninth inning, they're going to wind up with either a hold or a save, most likely, if they're pitching on a good team. Uh, so with that being said, what is your strategy in this format? Scott, we'll start with you. Saves plus holds. My strategy in this format, sort of like with head-to-head -head points, is wait until the very end of the draft to take all my relievers. Because the saves leaders tend to have more saves than the hold leaders have holds, if you're talking about a standard roto lineup, nine pitcher spots to fill. If, if you are going to go that route and, and just wait until the very end to take all your relievers, you probably need to get three of them to be competitive. Uh, you can't just settle for two, but there are so many options that that's not hard to do. Uh, yeah, there are, unless you play in an extremely deep league, like an AL or NL only format, there are always going to be hold sources out there. 
that are worth picking up. So there, it, it just isn't worth the investment to, um, to pay up for one unless they're heavily, heavily discounted. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's totally fine. And, uh, you know, I think it's not really a cheat code. It's pretty obvious, but just draft great relievers on great teams, right? Those are the ones that win the most games. They're going to wind up with the most cheap. holes, the most, as long seat. as they're cheap. That's, that's the, that's the point I'd stress most of all. And people wanted to hear about uh, the top holds leaders from last year. So Hector Neris, who was on the Astros, no longer. He signed with the Cubs this offseason. Should probably still work into either a good amount of holds or saves. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, Yanir Cano with the Orioles. Tyler Rogers with the Giants. Eric Swanson with the Blue Jays. Jason Foley with the Tigers. Mark Leiter Jr. with the Cubs. And Trevor Steffen with the Guardians. I think some names to target this year in hold leagues. Ryan Presley and Brian Abreu, obviously the Astros are going to win lots of games and they're going to have one of the best bullpens in all of baseball. Uh, Matt Brash with the Mariners, AJ Minter with the Braves, Jason Adam with Tampa Bay, Bruce Star Gratterall with the Dodgers. Kind of unique because he doesn't get strikeouts, but he does have good ratios and obviously pitches for one of the best teams in baseball. Uh, Chris, anything you wanted to add on holds or saves plus holds? No, I would just, yeah, like like I think it's worth keeping in mind what you said, which is that the saves leaders tend to get a lot more saves than the holds leaders. So when you look at like the top 20 in saves plus holds last season, you had Tyler Rogers, Mark Leiter, Eric Swanson, Hector Neris. Those were the only ones. So those four were the only ones in the top 20 if saves plus holds who had fewer than five saves. And then Yenier Cano and Jason Foley were the only ones who had fewer than 10 on top of that. So it's still the best saves plus holds guys are still going to mostly look like the best closers, often because most teams still do use their best reliever as their closer. It's pretty rare. Like you can argue Brian Abreu is the best closer on the or the best relief pitcher on the Houston Astros. He's not their closer. He's probably number three. You could have made that I argument. I said you can last... argue it. Okay. He's right. really, really good. <laughs> I mean, they, um, got, they got this Josh Hader guy now, Chris. That guy's really good too, but like, all right. I'm I'm, I'm a big Brian Abreu fan. I just want to point out. He's really good. 1.84 ERA, 188 strikeouts over the past two seasons. That's a good bit better than Josh Hader over the past two seasons. That's all I'm saying. He's really good. He might be their best reliever. He's probably third in line for saves. Something else that you'll see with holds is that there's not as many on the top end. There was only three with 30 plus. Yes. But there is more just kind of jumbled together with 20 plus. So there was 28 mm -hmm. relievers with 20 plus holds last year. Remember that there was only 23 with 20 plus saves. Mm -hmm. So multiple I mean, pitchers can get a hold in a, in a given game. Only one can get a save. They don't always get saves. Yeah. So, yeah. It's not a perfect science, believe me. But again, it's I would say try to try to target the best pitchers uh, on the best teams and, and you should be all right. And I have to say, as somebody who is resistant to the idea of going from saves to save hold, now that I have a little more experience with it, I enjoy it. It's so I much better. Enjoy making no investment in relievers and just watching everybody else make an investment and knowing I can get an edge on them that way. Well, it's also just like, it's nice to reward the best pitchers and not just the guys who pitch in one specific role. Yeah. You know, like and I, I we it's don't a little Rockies closer. And, and and it's a little feel like you don't, I don't have to in a saves plus holds league. I don't have to care about bad closers, yep. which is the worst is nice. thing about fantasy baseball. I also like that. There, you it never feels hopeless, you know, that it never feels mm -hmm. like you're in a futile situation where you just have to throw a bunch of fab dollars and hope you get lucky that 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 the guy who got the save on Friday ends up being the closer. Yeah, there's always plenty of whole guys out there. So, yeah. I, 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 I think I, I certainly can make an intellectual argument for pure saves leagues being better because let's face it, relief pitchers aren't that valuable. If, if not for that save scarcity, mm -hmm. that's why I'm saying wait until the end to take yours and not saves plus holds leagues. So from like a, a, a game construction standpoint, 
saves probably does make more sense as a category than saves plus holds, but I don't know. I kind of, we, I just kind of enjoyed playing. We spent so much time last year on the freaking Diamondbacks bullpen when none of those guys before they traded for Paul Seawald were any good and had any business being on fantasy rosters. And in a saves plus holds league, you just didn't have to worry about any of them. Yeah. It's great. I, I, you don't have to sweat out, oh, God, is Trevor May, he's not pitching anymore, but is Trevor May going to destroy my ratios? Like, ah, uh, Schultz forever. Hey, man, <laughs> shout out to Trevor May. He had 15 saves in the second half. Oh, he was, big, I made a winner. big charge in my big Roto League because of him, but it never felt good having him in my my lineup. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, strategy talk done. We've talked about saves, holds, all that fun stuff. Let's predict each team's bullpen, who we think will be the saves leader. Just give a name. I think we could save some analysis for later on when we do our sleepers, breakouts, bus, ADP, all that fun stuff. Uh, we will start in the National League and specifically the NL East, the Braves, obviously. Rice Iglesias. Yep. Yep. No question. Yes. All right. Rice Iglesias. Should we name a holds guy too? Or is that probably a mentor. Too? I'm sure people would enjoy that. <laughs> Probably yeah, I, I, a, AJ Minter is the probably the clearest bet for holes. Maybe Pierce Johnson too. But yeah, Rice Iglesias, very safe closer. All right. Next up, we have uh, the Marlins. Who, as of now, it looks like it's going to be Tanner Scott. Yeah, it's, it's Tanner Scott, and he was dominant. Like he was, he earned it. Yeah. I, I think it's worth pointing out. Now he has control issues and, and stability issues in his past, so maybe it all falls apart. But he is, he is not a closer. Just by default, he yeah. He they gave really, up a lot really for good. they gave up a lot for David Robertson, and Tanner Scott ended up being the closer anyway. In fact, and this isn't a this isn't a Tanner Scott specific point. I would say that the top seventeen relievers, sixteen relievers, because one of them is Cole Reagans. The top sixteen relievers, I don't think they're that different in terms of upside. Now you have Josh Hader, Devin Williams, and and. Um, uh, Edwin, Edwin Diaz at the yeah. top, they they probably are a step up in terms of upside. But mm -hmm. beyond that, the next 14 or 13, excuse me, from uh, Emmanuel Class A to Tanner Scott, I don't think their upside is really that different, which is another reason why I like to wait to draft saves I would, as much as reasonably possible. I would quibble with Emmanuel Class A, but he has to bounce back. What he did last season was certainly not. You know he's going to hurt you in strikeouts relative to some of those guys drafted in the 15 range. So I, it's, you know, it's, it's, he gets a lot of saves and the ERA is often low, but I mean, a big strikeout guy's probably going to have low ERA too. I do agree with your point about upside. There is something to be said for, I guess, safety and the higher floor. Mm -hmm. Of you course. Know, some of those guys have done it for longer time, uh, you know, longer track records than others, but yeah, your point remains Tanner Scott, by the way, last point on him. Um, I, I think there's lots of ranges of outcomes with relievers. Uh, I think he, he has some of the widest range mm -hmm. because he could, I think he could be a top five closer. I, I think he could be out of a job by May. So it's like, it's, I think there's a wide range there for Tanner Scott. If you're looking for a setup man for holds, uh, looks like Andrew Nardi there with the Marlins, the Mets, Edwin Diaz, he's coming back from last year's knee injury. So hopefully all good there. He's one of the top four relievers being drafted right now. And my guess is Adam Adovino. For holds. Yeah, I think you can make a case for Edwin Diaz just as the number one closer. Yep, I think you can make that case. The Phillies, uh, fun. Here we go. First one. Um, Probably Jose Alvarado, but manager Rob Thompson has mixed it up at times. I'm pretty sure he's already alluded to mm -hmm. being like an open bullpen. Alvarado has nasty stuff, but there's some other good names in there. Jeff Hoffman, Gregory Soto, Sir Anthony Dominguez, Orion Kirkering. There's a mm -hmm. lot. Ryan I mean, they're all good save source. Uh, like if you're in a saves plus hold leagues, I, I think if you draft Jose Alvarado or Jeff Hoffman or Ryan Kirkering, you're probably fine no matter who ends up getting the majority of saves between those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you are in a saves league, a traditional saves league, Alvarado is the way to go. We've said many, many times in the past that Jose Alvarado appears to be the favorite for saves, and he's never actually gotten. Yeah, his career high was time. 10 last year. Uh, so maybe that'll happen again. But if Alvarado steps into the closer role truly for the Phillies, among players who are projected closers today, he would have 
had the highest K per nine rate last year. So mm -hmm. we're, we're talking legitimate top five upside yeah. potentially for Alvarado and, and the amount of skepticism causes him to go very late. So I find he's my third closer or even if I'm desperate, my second closer pretty often. If you're trying to figure out how to spell the name Orion Kirkering, that last name is K E R K E R I N G. Just think of uh men in black. What happened? I think I know how to spell Orion. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think the Orion part is good. Uh, let's talk about the Nationals. It, it looks like it'll be Kyle fitting into the start, but my guess is I think Hunter Harvey will wind yeah. up leading this team if he could stay healthy, which has been an issue. It, it looked like that transition was already happening, and then Harvey got hurt again. And then Kyle Finnegan pr finished pretty strong. So that's, yeah, this is one of the least attractive bullpen situations, bottom five bullpen situation. I do think Finnegan is the preferred choice to draft, but not by much. Let's talk about the Cubs. There was a report earlier today that uh, Albert Alzali is not necessarily the team's mm -hmm. closer. Craig Council is obviously the manager there. And, you know, throughout his time with the Brewers, it seems like he has always had an elite closer type. Uh, Alzali was really good last year. The team signed Hector Neris, who does have closing experience. And he also pitched very well last season. So we'll see where this goes. My guess is still Albert Alzali. Mine too, but I mean, there were as soon as they signed Hector Neris, there were indications that maybe there were going to be a little, uh, a little less than committal with Alzali. So I dropped him a tier at that point in my tiers, and now he's in the same tier as. Uh, actually, I'm not seeing him in my tiers. I hope I didn't leave him out. Yeah, he's in the same tier as like Kenley Jansen and Jose Alvarado now and before. Alzali was a tier higher than that. All right. For the Reds, it will be Alexis Diaz. And I think if you're looking for holds, Emilio Pagan, Lucas Sims. Man, yeah, this is one where, like, I want to be out on Alexis Diaz, but that bullpen is just not very good. Like, Emilio Pagan feels like the worst possible fit for Cincinnati uh, as, a, as a pretty extreme fly ball pitcher. So... I don't necessarily like Alexis Diaz. I'm just not necessarily sure anybody's coming for the job. And this was an extreme enough split that I think it's worth mentioning. First half, Alexis Diaz looked like one of the best closers in baseball. 203 ERA, 13.7 K per nine. Second half, 461 ERA, 8.2 K per nine. And he has some control issues. I mean, he's in that top 16 I was talking about, but he, he does feel... He has a. He, he doesn't feel like he's totally safe in that role, I would say. Next up, the team across the chest of Scott White. The Brewers, Devin Williams, very obviously one of the top-tier closers in the game. There have been some whispers about trades there. And, and you know what? It's crazy to say. Even without Devin Williams, they still might be a really good bullpen because mm -hmm. the names that they have, Joel Piamps, Trevor McGill, Abner Uribe, they have some really electric arms there. They're better with Devin Williams, but uh, I would say watch out for those guys if a trade happens. Yeah. Yoel Piamps is a good hold source, I would say. Better than a lot of the ones we've mentioned so far. If he can sustain the strikeout gains from last year, for sure. Yeah. Next up for the Pirates, David Bednar, one of the best closers in fantasy last year. The team also went out and signed Aroldis Chapman. No worry about Bednar. They've already kind of squash that they've said David Bednar is the closer but you know if if Chapman can show us what he did like before the playoffs last year he was pretty damn dominant. it it lowers the margin for error for David Bednar where like before maybe he could have had like a three-week slump and hung on to the job now it might be you know two bad weeks for David Bednar maybe a role as Chapman starts to get an opportunity but David Bednar is very good. We don't have any reason to think he's going to, to lose the job. It's just relievers are incredibly high variance. For the Cardinals, it looks like it should be Ryan Helsley who uh, needs to stay healthy. That's the biggest issue. Only 36 and two-thirds innings last year, um, but throws incredibly hard and obviously some big swinging strike rates. If you're looking for holds in that bullpen, uh, probably Giovanni Gallegos and mm -hmm. maybe Jojo Romero. Yep. All right, fair enough. Let's move over to the NL West, the Diamondbacks. They traded for Paul Seawald last year. 
pretty obviously the closer, right? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I feel like in drafts, he goes the latest in the tier that I have him in. I have him in the same tiers like Camilo Duvall, Jordan Romano, uh, David Bednar. You know, he's he's got a track record in the ninth inning, far more job security than he had in Seattle. Great numbers the last two years. I'm, I'm not really sure why there seems to be hesitation to take him as as a, as a top reliever, but I'm, I don't know. I find him drafting Paul Seawald a lot. I don't. Certainly there are no threats to his role there in Arizona, given what they went through before they acquired Paul Seawald from the Mariners. Yeah, the only thing I would point to is that after he was traded to Arizona, the control was spotty, uh, up over five walks per nine with the Diamondbacks last year. So something to watch, but I, I think this, the leash is pretty long there with Seawald. Uh, the next name up would be Kevin Ginkle, but is battling some elbow soreness here early on in spring training. Next up, we have the Rockies, and it looks like it'll be Justin Lawrence versus Tyler Kinley. And to be honest, <laughs> might not matter. <laughs> yeah, I if someone gets 20 saves here, I'll be surprised. Fair. Just the combination of really, really nasty ERA and whip. So yeah, like Justin Lawrence at least does, I, I think, look like a better pitcher. So if you have to pick yeah. one, he's the one, but it probably shouldn't be. I would with target a, Kyle a top 20 opinion. round pick. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we have the Dodgers. Evan Phillips should get the majority of the saves. I think last year it was like 24 of 44. So he's not like other elite closers where he gets 90% of the save opportunities. Bruce Dark Ratterall, as I mentioned, I think a, a fair name in, in mm -hmm. Colts. Though it does seem like Dave Roberts has backed up Phillips as a closer more vocally this spring than he did last year it was frustrating at times he'd have long stretches where he'd get like maybe one save or no saves and Gratterall would steal some and uh and it was frustrating but Evan Phillips has the numbers to be an elite closer and I think there is more I I think he I, I think his manager is backing him more this year than than it seemed last year the only thing I worry about Evan Phillips, and this is me kind of like galaxy brain, but the Dodgers are clearly going for it. It wouldn't surprise me if they go out and trade for one of these top tier elite closers. And then next thing you know, Evan Phillips is a setup man on the team. So just sure. something uh, I've worried about. Evan Phillips numbers the last two years over 60 innings in each. So, you know, legit sample 159 ERA 0.8 whip. And I'm rounding up there. Uh, 10.4 K per nine. So very good. If, if it's true that Roberts is really committing to him in the role, he could be, he could be top five. This is this what, what I'm saying in terms of upside, how, mm -hmm. how many, in, how many uh, intended closers appear to uh, be on equal footing as far as upside goes for the giants, Camilo Duvall, one of the elite closers from last year. Uh, and then for holds, Tyler Rogers had 30 of them last season. Good ratios, but only 7.3K per nine. So not going to give you many strikeouts. Uh, Taylor Rogers will give you one more A. <laughs> uh, yes, he will give you many more strikeouts too, but the ERA was a little bit inflated last year. That brings us to the Padres, last team in the National League, which looks like it's pretty wide open right now. You've got Robert Suarez, Yuki Matsui, Wu Sucko, Wandy Peralta, uh, the, two of those names you, you might have never heard of. Yuki Matsui coming over from Japan, where he had 236 career saves. He's also five foot eight left handed pitcher. So uh, I'm very excited to watch him pitch and see how it goes. Uh, Wu Sucko, big strikeouts in the KBO, but also big walks. He had 139 saves over in Korea. Yeah, I mean, both of these guys had. Massive strikeout rates for Major League Baseball, let alone Major League Baseball average strikeout rate is about 22%. In the KBO and uh, Nippon League, it's like 17 to 19%. And both of these guys were like well north of 30, 35% the last couple of seasons. So both Yuki Matsui and Wusuk Go have shown the ability to get a ton of strikeouts. I think they're both super interesting. I don't think it's worth having a strong opinion 
one way or the other on the Padres bullpen as far right now. I would just suggest throw a late round dart at one of them and and hope you get a good reliever out of it one way or the other. Did I see the other day? I'm having trouble finding it now, and I've been taking copious notes this spring. Did I see the other day that there was a report that the plan going in is for Robert Suarez to get the majority of the saves? Do either of you remember seeing that? Did I dream it? <laughs> I did not see that. I, I think, in okay. fact, what I um, saw was that Mike Schilt declined to name a closer. And that it is, yeah, there was. I, I saw that from early February, but there was something more recent. I thought, well, I can't find yeah, it. Yeah, I haven't so seen I guess anything. It's not worth digging into, but uh, provided that hasn't been reported, my choice would be Matt Suey. And I think the fact that they signed uh, Willie Peralta away from the Yankees, giving them another left handed reliever, makes it more feasible that Matt Suey could get uh the ninth inning job handed to him but it's it's pretty up in the air robert swore is probably my second choice if uh if i'm ranking them in that way that would, that would be wandy peralta scott wandy peralta sorry <laughs> willie peralta, former brewers reliever that's right if i'm just choosing one of these names i i would go with yuki matsui as well let's take our final break when we return into the american league we go here on fantasy baseball today the madness doesn't just happen. Yo, get ready! And although it's marked on our calendars each year, it's built by moments of mayhem before. And the crowd goes crazy! And it begins to bubble long before it bursts. Sure, madness in March may go hand in hand, but it starts right here. Welcome back in. Let's predict each American League bullpen. And first up, we have the Orioles who signed Craig Kimbrell to a one-year $13 million deal. He will be the team's closer, and the top setup man will be Yanir Cano. Yeah, as as long as Craig Kimbrell can hold on to it, which is increasingly a problem for him. When he's... When his he's not terrible, run. he's when shaky. He, he was good last yeah. year. Yeah, when when he, I mean, two of the last three years, he's been awesome. That year, he was closing for the Cubs, and then got traded to the White Sox midseason. It's just he he seems to lose he seems to lose it at times, mm -hmm. and 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 is unable to command, and uh, that's when he gets into trouble. But I mean, twelve point three K per nine last year. Over the last three years, Craig Kimbrell has uh, twelve point seven K per nine. So the upside is clearly there, especially on a team as good as the Orioles. But yeah, he could have he could have a two week stretch where he completely bombs, and then maybe Yanir Cano is getting a look in the ninth inning again. Which, by the way, it didn't go so well for him when he took yeah, over Felix Bautista late last year. Doesn't have the elite strikeout rate either. So yeah, there's there's some shakiness there as well. The Boston Red Sox, Kenley Jansen will be the closer, assuming he's healthy <laughs> and on the team, because currently delayed with lat soreness, he's been subject to trade rumors. The other options, there's Chris Martin, there's Garrett Whitlock, Tanner Houck. The team signed Liam Hendricks, but a reminder that uh, he's likely going to miss the entire uh, season mm -hmm. due to Tommy John surgery he had last August. Yeah, I don't have a, a feel for who it would be if not Kenley Jansen. So wouldn't wouldn't be chasing them speculatively ahead of time at least. Chris Martin would be my first guess, but yeah, it's not a strong guess. I mean, it could be whoever loses the fifth starter job between Garrett Whitlock and Tanner Houck. For the Yankees, Clay Holmes for now, but they were uh, the Yankees were rumored to be interested in a ton of relievers this offseason. Josh Hader, Robert Stevenson, Jordan Hicks, basically all of them. Um, I think a name to watch, Jonathan Loizaga, if he's not the closer, could provide holds. Sure. Yeah. I, all right. I, I I don't know. Like, do you guys feel comfortable with Clay Holmes? I feel like I have him a tier lower than everyone else seems to. He just tends to go earlier in drafts than I'm looking to take him. Yeah, he, he's, he's not really up. one of the closers I'm I'm looking for. Yeah, there's no. not a great alternative in the Yankees bullpen now, mm -hmm. but they they yeah. always seem to be. He, he always seems to be hanging by a thread, you know. And he has like a two week period where they try other guys, and then they always go back to Clay Holmes. I mean, the numbers yeah. are fine, but. And the, I just don't know if I trust the guy who throws, like, it's a really nasty sinker, but a 70% sinker rate is, yeah. that's, that's tough. Like that, that just 
feels like you're dancing on a knife's edge every time he goes out there, even though a well under three ERA, I think two years in a row. That's what's so interesting is watching Yankees games last year. He felt so shaky mm-hmm. when I looked into the numbers before. No, he's really good. He's actually good, man. Like yeah. everything is there. He gets 65% ground balls. Like you probably want more whiffs from a traditional closer or whatever, an elite closer. I'd rather have him as my second closer on a team, Scott, than my first one. But yeah, I, I think having him a tier lower is totally fine. He's Four. like a number two and a half closer to me. He's not among that top 16 mm-hmm. I was referring to earlier that all had close to the same upside. For the Rays, Pete Fairbanks, we know he's awesome when he's healthy at 25 saves last year. And uh, for a setup man for holds, Jason Adam, also really good. Jason Adam... Best. Definitely in any 15 team Roto League should get drafted. I think he's even worth drafting in 12 team Roto Leagues. He's gotten 20 saves over the past two seasons. He gives you elite ratios. I think that's just a useful guy to have around. And Pete Fairbanks has hurt a lot. Yes. And as I said, Kevin Cash was very predictable with his bullpen usage last year. When Fairbanks was healthy, he was getting the saves. When Fairbanks wasn't healthy, Jason Adam was getting the saves. So yeah, I, I would say Adam is probably the most valuable setup man in fantasy for the blue jays jordan romano is uh, one of those nine relievers for me that i think are really safe and then um for holds with the blue jays eric swanson was among the holds leaders last year yeah the only thing with romano is just missed a little time with a back issue last season and then in 2021 he had that elbow issue that ultimately ended up being a relatively minor problem but it, it sticks in the back of your in the back of your head, I think for the white Sox, it might not matter. They traded away Gregory Santos this off season. They signed John Brebbia to a one year, $5.5 million deal. That would be my guess. They also acquired prospect prelander Barroa who throws extremely hard. He gets whiffs, but has no idea where the ball is going. So maybe he gets a shot, but my guess would be Brebbia. Yeah, but my bold prediction is nobody in this bullpen gets even double-digit saves. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> that, I, is, that is possible. I will say uh, Brebbia is kind of just Gregory Santos. Yeah. So, like, that, that, it's a profile that, if you look at what they did in the minors, it's a profile that I feel like could really play up in the bullpen if they give him that opportunity. If you want a really deep name in their bullpen, I mean, just for the deepest leagues, I've seen some people hyping up this kid, Jordan Leisure. Uh, I, I I think he's only pitched in the minors and he had like, apparently his stuff plus and all these other kind of crazy metrics mm-hmm. grayed out. Well, but I just don't know if the ninth inning suits him. So that's a dumb joke. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying, I was trying to leisure. think of, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. I was trying to think of a way to work leisure into a joke too. He's just a little laid back. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, for the guardians, yeah. for the guardians, it'll be Emmanuel class a who led the league in saves and in blown saves last year. <laughs> There have been, been some trade whispers the past couple of years. Uh, Scott Barlow is also on this team. Uh, Trevor Steffen pitched really well last year. So I don't know. It's classic yeah. for now. He, he's the first of the, we're not like ranking the closers, but he's fourth, I think, in the consensus rankings for the three of us. I imagine he's fourth in ADP as well. He's the first one where I think there are real red flags in the profile. His, he lost a little bit of velocity on his cutter, and it just kind of took the profile down a step across the board. He got his worst strikeout rate ever, worst expected Wobon contact ever. It was still really good because he throws a 97-mile-per-hour cutter. But it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. He was He was not nearly as good last year as he had been before in ways that I think are a little troubling. For I think the- James Karinchek is still the best hold source here. Okay. Volatile, but you know he's going to give you a lot of strikeouts. And he, you know, he did work the eighth inning a lot last year ahead of Class A. For the Tigers, it looks like it'll be Alex Lang. He actually had 26 saves last year, but mm-hmm. I think he's got to keep that head on a swivel because there are other talented relievers in this bullpen. Jason Foley, Will Vest, they both pitched well last year. And I think a really deep name to watch is Shelby Miller. Uh, he pitched well with the Dodgers last season. And after signing him, their president of baseball operations, Scott Harris, said, quote, he has the pure stuff to pitch at the very back end of our bullpen. I think that wording is 
it's very interesting. You know, he he didn't have to say the very back end of the bullpen, but he did. I, I missed the name. What was the name? Shelby Miller. Very deep name. Oh. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I think I think they definitely want Lang to have the role. And so I have him. I have him like a little ahead of Kyle Finnegan. Uh, if if there was clarity in the Padres bullpen situation, I'd have them ahead of Lang. But, you know, I, I think there's a good chance Lang gives you 20 plus saves this year. They pretty much stuck with him all of last year, even though he had really rough patches. He's, his stuff is great. I mean, he gets a lot of whiffs. So he's he, he, you definitely see upside for Alex Lang as a closer. You see why the Tigers keep giving him chances. But yeah, he just may. He just may walk himself out of the role, especially now that they have an alternative as good as, as like a Shelby Miller. Because backing up Lang last year was mostly Jason Foley, who put up pretty good numbers, but doesn't, yeah. doesn't really have closer stuff. I think... Again, mentioned the name, but Will Vest, too. I mean, they have some relievers that pitched really well last season. So uh, we'll see where it goes for the Tigers. For the Royals, they signed Will Smith to a one-year $5 million deal, which means they will either win the World Series or trade him to a team who will win the World Series. <laughs> uh, Ken Rosenthal wrote an article a few weeks ago that highlighted Smith is viewed as the leading candidate candidate to serve as the team's closer to begin the season. Yeah, that would be my guess, given the contract, given his experience in the role. Uh, John McMillan is very, very interesting, though. His minor league numbers are pretty bonkers. Uh, he pitched about 50 innings last season across three levels. He had uh, 91 strikeouts across like 51 and a third innings. So really good stuff. Got up to the majors last year, only pitched four innings, got eight strikeouts, has a 100 mile an hour fastball and a Really good swing and miss slider. So John McMillan is a name worth keeping an eye on if Will Smith fum uh, fumbles. Sure. Let's go with that. I know some people have hyped up James MacArthur as well. He kind of ended the year getting some saves for them. He, he had really good control. Uh, so could be kind of open. But for now, I think it's it's Will Smith. For the Twins, it'll be Yoan Duran, who was awesome last year. Uh, the Twins actually just have a really good bullpen. If you need holds, I think Griffin Jacks, Brock Stewart in the mix as well. It's good. Bullpen. I'm a little surprised. Johan Duran. Look, I, I don't, I don't see a huge difference in them, but I'm, I'm a little surprised. Duran is going ahead of like Jordan Romano, Camilo Duvall. I had him toward the back end of that tier, and it seems like everyone else has him at the front of that tier. And I think just from you know, just from the perspective of Rocco Baldelli as his manager, and until last year, was very resistant to having a set closer. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I share the favoritism that so many seem to have for Yoan Duran. Again, but, I don't care that much, but when you're when you're having to pick nits, that seems like a pretty big one. I think part of it is just Duran is just nasty, and there's there's a lot of really fun gifs of his stuff out there. And so uh, he, he's also probably just a better pitcher than Romano and Camilo Duvall and then that tier. Um, and they did use him more like a traditional closer as the season went on, right? It was oh, yeah, no, they of definitely those, did. They definitely yeah, it was did. fewer I'm of those multi-inning outings. And yeah, I'm, I'm just saying uh, among all the managers in baseball, Rocco Baldelli is still one of the trust. I, one of the ones I trust the least mm -hmm. in terms of how he's going to manage his bullpen. For the Astros, we know they signed Josh Hader to a huge contract. He was officially named the team's closer last week. And for holds, I, I think we could point to multiple names. Brian Abreu, Ryan Presley, maybe even Rafael Montero. This bullpen's going to be so good. I, I thought it was weird that there was any suspense. Like, I saw people in, on fantasy Twitter like, yes, they named Josh Hader their closer. It's like, you don't give that guy a five-year contract for him not to be the closer. That was one that just, there was never any question in my mind, at least. There was, some people were trying to say because they don't have another lefty that they can go to, like maybe a couple of times per year if like the best lefties are coming up in the sure. eighth game, that'll happen, but. Maybe a couple times per year. I Right, like, I yeah, think the okay. way you phrased it is perfect. Yeah, I'm probably, uh, I'm not doing it justice the way that other people were worried about it, but to be uh, fair, I'm not worried about it either. I think 
Yeah, he's just a guy. For the Angels, everything has pointed to Carlos Estevez to begin the year. He had 31 saves last season with a 6.59 ERA in the second half. The team signed Robert Stevenson to a three-year, $33 million deal, and he was ridiculous with the Tampa Bay Rays last season. Scott, this is one of those where the person who might start the year closing is not as good, or at least I don't think so, as the person who's backing him up. Yes, I think Carlos Estevez is the most obvious choice. If you're picking the, the closer most likely to lose his job next year, I, th I think it's him. I don't think... I don't think uh, you can come up with a stronger candidate than him because the, the talent disparity there between him and Robert Stevenson is so glaring. We're basing this on small samples, obviously, which is usually the case with relievers. Maybe maybe Stevenson just got just had a really lucky run from the time the Rays acquired him in June to the end of the season when he put together a 235 ERA, a .68 whip, and 14.1K per nine. And if you dig into some of the the if you dig a little deeper into the the dominant stats, let's call them, um, in terms of how often batters swung and missed, uh, he was in a different category from every reliever. And it coincided with the Rays giving Robert Stevenson a new cutter. They're great at bringing out the best in pitchers, and they seem to do it with Robert Stevenson as well. Got him this three-year deal with the Angels. Um, meanwhile. Carlos Estevez was a disaster in the second half. I think his ERA was approaching seven and um, always seemed like he was too combustible for the closer role. Anyway, I don't, I, I'm not going to like it's, it's, I think it's distinctly possible. Carlos Estevez loses his job before the season begins because uh, angels GM has said he, he still considers Estevez the team's closer, but he's leaving it up to new manager, Ron Washington. So, Maybe Washington will make a different call and it'll just be Stevenson on opening day and rest of the season. But if it's not, if it is Estevez, don't expect it to last long. I mean, I'll, I'll go so far as to say like Stevenson needs to be drafted ahead of Estevez. And I don't think, I don't think either of you guys would disagree with that. Uh, no. no, I think I have Stevenson ranked ahead of Estevez though. It is close just because there's, a sliver of doubt that the angels don't do the right thing for the A's. A couple of weeks ago, their GM came out and said, uh, mentioned three names that could factor into the closer mix. Mason Miller, Danny Jimenez, and Trevor Gott. Mason Miller is so far and away the more, most interesting guy in this competition. Um, he has thrown 89 in the third innings as a professional. We're including the Arizona fall league. We have to include the Arizona fall league to get him to 89 in the third innings over three seasons. So that's strike one against Mason Miller. And it's a pretty big one. He has, I believe it's 119 strikeouts in those 89 innings. I mean, the, the stuff is, is nasty. He was really effective as a major leaguer in a very small sample size last year, despite the lack of experience that he had. It just, it feels like if he can hold up, he might be a truly elite closer. I think Mason Miller has that kind of upside. For the Mariners, it should be Andres Munoz. Uh, after they traded away Paul Seawald, the Mariners had 18 saves and Munoz had 11 of them. So I feel like it could be an Evan Phillips, Yoan Duran kind of situation where mm -hmm. he doesn't get all the saves, but he gets like 70 to 75% <laughs> of them and has really good ratios. Yeah, Scott's service is pretty frustrating with this. And he was when Paul Seawald was there. Mm -hmm. Uh and he remains so. I, it seemed like after Paul Seawald was traded to the Diamondbacks, oh yes, finally we're getting uh, Andres Munoz is finally being to anointed to the role he was always destined for. Because you remember, even back as a 21 year old with the Padres, people were touting Andres Munoz as a future closer. And yeah, it turned out not to be nearly as consistent as we hoped. Matt Brash has, is a great bat misser himself, control issues, but a big strikeout guy. Uh, this is a really good Great. bullpen. One of the best choices for holds, saves plus holds leagues, I would say, is Brash because he'll occasionally steal saves from Munoz, potentially. And when he's not, he's probably the best choice for saves in the Mariners' bullpen. But Munoz has a ton of upside. He's among the, the 16 relievers I was referring to earlier. That's it. End of sentence. <laughs> All righty. And last but not least, the Rangers, who... 
It looks like it'll be an open competition. We know Jose Leclerc was uh, the final pitcher on the mound in the World Series last year, but they brought in David Robertson. Bruce Bochy said, uh, there, quote, there is no pecking order between Leclerc and other members of the bullpen. And he added, we will have a guy who will get uh, closing opportunities come opening day. So it sounds like he wants a closer to emerge, but <laughs> yeah. hasn't named one. So Yeah, that, I, I found that odd. And I, I know I've kind of been alone on this podcast and in, in saying, guys, it's obviously Leclerc. He was their ace reliever on their march to a World Series championship. They they used him the way a team would normally use a shutdown closer. And for the most part, he came through. Um, now, David Robertson wasn't there when that was happening. Mm. So that would be the one potential threat to Leclerc. But I don't think he's distinctly better than Leclerc. So I imagine Leclerc has the leg up. I, and, and and maybe Bruce Bochy is just giving himself an out in case Leclerc's occasional control lapses return this spring. Have there but been I, like limitations on Leclerc's usage? Like, do they use him on back to back days pretty regularly? That that's the one thing I'm trying to trying to fig- remember. Well, I know in the past they used they're having the playoffs. Right. Like I said, they used him as an ace reliever. Uh, looking at he the only game pitched on last year. He only pitched on consecutive days five times last year. Yeah, and that that's and, something with his injury history. It's possible that they just don't feel super comfortable declaring him the full time closer because of that. Mm-hmm. That that's the only thing I can think possibly, of. But, but on a Bochy performance say, level, he's much better than. I, but, I th- but, yeah, but Bochi did say he wants a closer. That was the 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 first half of it was. Ah, we don't know who our closer is. The second half of it was, yeah. but we want a closer. So I don't think it'll be a situation where Leclerc is closing two thirds of the time and Robertson is one third of the time. Mm-hmm. A really deep name in uh, just the Rangers organization. I don't even know if he's going to be on their opening day roster. Probably not. Uh, a prospect I saw out in the Arizona Fall League, Emiliano Teodo, just dude lights up the radar gun and just striking people out left and right. He threw 11 shutout innings in the AFL with 19 strikeouts. Uh, so at some point, I mean, maybe it's like later on in the year. Wouldn't surprise me if he factors in. All right. That took a lot more time than I thought it was going to take, <laughs> but we are here. Sleepers, breakouts, and busts. Uh, give me a name and like a sentence. And uh, we will start with Chris. Uh, Orion Kirkering and Mason Miller both have really, really nasty stuff. Mason Miller has a more clear path to the ninth inning role for the A's. I hope he gets the the closer nod out of spring training because I think it's the most fun possibility. And uh, I think both are really, really nice sleepers. Scott? I just need to name one, right? Sure. Okay. Yuki Matsui is closing history in Japan. I think will go a long way to... Uh, securing him the role for the Padres, even if he doesn't start out as the full-time closer for them, I think he gains that role in short order. He is probably the reliever in Roto Leagues that I'm drafting most often as my third quote-unquote closer, Yuki Matsui. Well, it's a clean sweep because I like Mason Miller. I like Orion Kirkering. I like Yuki Matsui. The only other name I had listed here was Shelby Miller, again with the Tigers. Very, very deep sleeper. Sounds like the Tigers just kind of left open that that possibility of Shelby Miller working in at the back end of the bullpen. What about a breakout? Scott, we'll start with you first. So this is kind of a weird category at this position because I assume to break out, you have to not already be installed as the closer. I mean, you can make whatever rules you want for it, I guess, but I'm making that rule for it. And I'm saying Jose Alvarado then is my, Breakout choice at this position. Again, his 13.9 K per nine last year would lead all intended closers this year. And, uh, you know, he had 14.3 K per nine the year before. So Jose Alvarado has done this for a long time. He's been a dominant reliever for a long time. He's been a closer and waiting for a long time. Phillies do have good alternatives, which makes it less than a slam dunk. He will be the guy finally now. But he is, I think, the leading candidate. And I'm hopeful, fingers crossed, finally works out for Jose Alvarado this time. I probably should do my job and give everyone the ADP. Jose Alvarado 
His ADP is 207 as the 25th reliever off the board. I can give you some of the other ones. Uh, not Mason Miller because he's listed as a starting pitcher. Uh, how about Yuki Matsui? His ADP is 299.5. Orion Kirkering, 332. So we're looking at some very deep names there. Chris, you're up with a breakout. I will go with Robert, not Lewis Stevenson, who had a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde season last year, if you see what I did there. But once he got to the Rays, they had him spam that cutter. He threw it over 40% of the time. 2.35 ERA, 0.68 whip, 43% strikeout rate. He is someone who has never been a closer. He has three saves in his career, a true breakout in every sense of the word coming up this season after he makes short work of Carlos Estevez in the Angels ninth inning. The ADP for Stevenson, 241.8, 29th reliever off the board, currently going 20 picks ahead of Carlos Estevez. So As he should. Like the market is uh, in agreement with both of you guys on Robert Stevenson. I cheated here with a breakout, someone who already has the role, but I, I really do think that he can just excel and emerge into being a top five closer in fantasy. And that is Andres Munoz with the Mariners. Nasty stuff, throws 99 miles per hour, 12.3K per nine. Walks could be a problem for him. It helps that he gets ground balls. So if he does give out free passes, he could turn those into double plays. If the Mariners just kind of lean into him as the closer and we get 30 plus saves. Yeah, I think he could finish as a top five uh, reliever in fantasy this year. How about a bust? Chris, we will start with you. Uh, we didn't spend much time talking about Alexis Diaz, but I have a lot of concerns about him. I think he just might not be all that good, despite having a very good ERA for the most part, but he has, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty bad control for an elite closer. He is a fly ball pitcher pitching in one of the worst ballparks to be a fly ball pitcher in. Somehow he's only had a 6.8% career home run to fly ball rate. Average is more like double that. If that happens, I think things could get really, really ugly for Alexis Diaz. The only problem is I there's nobody else in the Reds bullpen who I feel strongly about as a as an alternative. So that's the thing that makes me not want to call Diaz a a bust. But yeah, I I think from a performance standpoint, there's a ton of risk there. I do agree with you that Emilio Pagan, his skill set just does not fit. Cincinnati, but they did go out and give him mm -hmm. some money and he does have some closing experience. So maybe if Diaz doesn't work out or if he's walking everyone, it, it could be Pagan as the next man up. Um, yeah, that second half was bad. The fastball velocity was also down 1.2 miles per hour last year for Diaz. They used him a in lot. the second half or overall, overall, uh, okay. just from 2022 to 2023, it was down 1.2 miles per hour. The Reds used Alexis Diaz a lot in the second half. That could be the reason why he kind of wore down, but it doesn't change the fact that he did wear down. Um, and I do have my concerns. He is a bust for me as well. Scott, you're up. Well, he's no stranger to being called a bust in fantasy, but I, I, I think this is finally the year it all falls apart for Kenley Jansen. Ah. It's on the wrong side of 35. Now he's already dealing with a lat issue. He's, no stranger to health issues in general, obviously. Um, season ended early last year due to injury. He's hasn't exactly been a lockdown closer in a while. He he keeps getting the benefit of the doubt as far as that goes. Has such a long history closing. I, he just keeps getting to do it. But the last two years, the ERA has been around three five. Four of the last five years, he's had an ERA of three thirty three or worse. Um. It's sort of like the red situation where there isn't a great alternative in this bullpen, but sometimes the best alternative comes out of nowhere. We don't even see him coming. And, um, and of course, if Kenley Jansen isn't available to pitch even, then that's, that's going to force them to go with somebody else. So yeah, Kenley Jansen, even though he appears to have a very secure role, I find even as somebody who goes the thrifty route for my saves, just not that interested in taking him. Favorite to draft, Chris? Just give me a name. Cole Reagans. Is that cheating? <laughs> That's fine. You can give me a Sparp and a closer. Oh, I have to give you a closer? You can't be the Cole oh, Reagans guy. Come on. I, uh, Paul Seawald. 
Fair enough. Scott. Yeah, draft a lot of Seawald. I don't, I don't really like drafting closers. My favorite to draft, though, because I, I like the bang for the buck, is Tanner Scott. He was legitimately an ace closer last year, and nobody, nobody treats him as such. Understandably, given his history, but I buy it. And for me, favorite to draft, Rysel Iglesias. Let's quickly wrap up with ADP and just kind of run through anything that might stand out here. Uh, again, via Fantasy Pros, average draft position. And it looks like there's a clear top four in ADP. Devin Williams, Josh Hader, Emmanuel Class A, Edwin Diaz, all going between picks 46 and 58. Uh, and then there's a bit of a drop to the fifth reliever. Do you guys agree with this kind of top tier of four? I, it's a top tier of three for me. I have Class A, a tier lower. I think Williams, Hader, Diaz, they're the ace closers. Class A really depends on having a microscopic ERA to be on their level because he doesn't get near the strikeouts they do. He gets so many saves that, or he has gotten so many saves that he probably belongs in this tier. But if he gets 37 rather than 44 or whatever it is, it's because he's been 40 plus two years in a row. Um mm -hmm. He probably, yeah, belongs a, a half tier, maybe a full tier down. Yeah, the Guardians last year led all of baseball with 81 save opportunities. So if you were wondering, well, how did Class A lead the league in saves and blown saves? Well, that was how it happened. We <laughs> dropped down into round six and seven in a 12-team league where we have five names, Camilo Duvall, Yoan Duran, Rysel Iglesias, Jordan Romano, and David Bednar. Seems pretty safe with this entire group. I, I feel like the only one we really didn't, well, I didn't really say much about Rysel Iglesias. He, he just seems rock solid, massive strikeout rates on one of the best teams in baseball. We didn't really say much about Doval either, I guess. Anything to add on him? No. no I mean, he's obviously secured the role. Great park. Uh, should be a good outfield defense for him. I, I think there's a lot to like there. Mm-hmm. This with, is a very comfortable tier, and and it, I would include Paul Seawald in this tier, I guess, which is why I keep drafting him because ADP yeah. he's going twenty spots later. Iglesias just doesn't get quite as many saves as you would think. I think is the only thing like his save totals are always weirdly low. He did miss a big portion early last season. Remember? Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and still had thirty three saves. Yeah. So. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, he's he's pretty awesome. That this is that's the group that I really shop in is mm -hmm. usually getting one of Iglesias, Romano, or or Bednar as yeah. my first closer. Uh, Iglesias missed all of April last year. Two names going in rounds eight and nine of twelve team leagues: Alexis Diaz and Cole Reagans, who we've talked a lot about. He is a Sparp. He is the top Sparp in fantasy baseball. We already talked about Diaz, so let's move on. Five names going between picks one hundred eight and one hundred twenty: Paul Seawald, Andres Munoz. Ryan Helsley, Pete Fairbanks, Evan Phillips. Anything to add on those? Seawald, Munoz, Helsley, Fairbanks, Phillips. No. Um, I probably... I don't find myself taking Helsley. I know he's nasty. I He missed time with a strained right forearm last year. For someone who throws 99 mm -hmm. miles per hour, that just scares me a lot. And Oliver Marmol has been Annoying. a little bit... A little bit annoying, yeah, <laughs> with his reliever usage. I, I, I'm going to, you know what, I've been saying 16 relievers have close to the same upside. I'm going to put Evan Phillips in there, too. I actually wasn't including him, so it is actually 17. So rewind the podcast and every reference to 16, <laughs> make it 17. All right, the next tier of ADP has six names. Clay Holmes, Tanner Scott, Michael King, who's a Sparp, Craig Kimbrell, Adbert Alzali, and Kenley Jansen, all going between picks 135 and 168. And this is the part of the draft, ideally for me, in a Roto League, where I would like to have two relievers at this point, by the end of this group. Um, yeah, we talked about Clay Holmes, talked a good amount about Tanner Scott. I mean, the control just improved so dramatically last year. Mm -hmm. You look at the first five years of his career, 5.8 walks per nine. Last year, down to 2.8 walks per nine. So that's, that's why I said the range of outcomes here, like yeah, if yeah. the control regresses, he could lose that job quickly. If it remains, I, I think he has like top three, top five closer upside. I think the expectation should be that there's at least some regression. It's just a question of does he regress to like unusable in high leverage situations? That That's a bigger question. Anything else to add on Alzali and the Cubs? Because he pitched so well, 267 ERA, 102 whip. 
had 22 saves last year. But again, they brought in Hector Neris, who does have closing experience from his days in Philadelphia. My guess is that if Alzali does what he's supposed to this spring, it'll be him. But he's, he obviously doesn't have a long track record in the role, so they're 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 keeping Hector Neris there as a fallback. That's my guess. This I'm not is exactly one of those, the closer whisperer. This is one of those situations that highlights why it's so hard to do this on October 21st. Or wow, it would be hard to do <laughs> on October 21st. <laughs> Season hasn't started already. Chris already wants. Wow! To I just like I don't know. My the screensaver just turned on in my brain out of February twenty first. Um, six weeks away from opening day, not six months. Yeah, and a lot could change. We will. Yeah, we'll do some kind of like pres- position previews updates uh, as we get closer to uh, the start of the season. Probably some point in in mid March. After Kenley Jansen, we get two Sparps, Nick Pavetta at pick 188, Ryan Pepio at 194. We spoke about each of those on SP Preview Part 3. Next up, a group of five, Jose Alvarado, Ryan Presley, Alex Lang, Jose Leclerc, Robert Stevenson. I think we've spent enough time on this group, right? Anything else to add? Nope. Okay. Next group of five, Kyle Finnegan, Carlos Estevez, Robert Suarez, Brian Abreu, Aroldis Chapman, all going between picks 250 and 290. I guess we should talk a little bit about Robert Suarez and why I guess we're doubting him. We, we're, we keep, we've keep we chosen Yuki Matsui to be the prospective saves leader there. Suarez was really good two years ago when he first came back to the majors, mm-hmm. but last year kind of regressed. He throws hard, but the strikeout rate wasn't very good. I don't know. He's he's kind of a tough reliever to figure out. I don't know what to make of him, honestly. Yeah, they they just haven't the the Padres just haven't given us any real reason to think he's the guy. Um, and and the fact that they went out and you know it's not like they paid Matsui and Go huge money, but like Matsui, it is a three year contract. It was like a a pretty a substantial ish commitment for a reliever who's never pitched in the majors, if I'm remembering correctly. So. I just I think that probably speaks to a a lack of total faith in Suarez as the answer in the late innings. So Yuki Matsui can earn up to thirty three point six million dollars over five seasons. There you go. If he becomes the team's closer. Yeah. So that's that's a that's a pretty significant. I, I, Wusak goes contract. I don't think was was anywhere near that. No, no, it was not. Uh, all right. Next up, we have five more names: Yanir Cano, Yuki Matsui, Matt Brash, Jason Adam, Will Smith. This is the territory where we get into high end setup men who obviously are, are going to be drafted um, probably a little bit higher than this in saves plus holds leagues, just because they'll give you either really good ratios or strikeouts, a combo of both maybe. Yeah, I think, I think we've said everything we really need to say about them. Okay. Uh, next up we have Orion Kirkering, Matt Strom, Hunter Harvey, Bruce star Gratterall, Chris Martin. We mentioned with Harvey, He's had st- trouble staying on the field, but man, last year when he pitched, the ERA, the whip, all the underlying numbers, better than Kyle Finnegan. So that's one where I could, if he stays healthy, I could see him taking over. Matt Strom is an interesting guy for like 15 team leagues because he does give you a little more volume than your typical closer got 108 or a typical reliever. He got 108 strikeouts last year with good ratios. So he's an interesting one to have on like the back of your bench to fill in when you have injuries and stuff, Matt Strom. All right. Uh, I don't know. I think we've pretty much covered it all. Is there anyone else that we've missed or later names, any other deep spec closers or anything that stands out at reliever that we haven't mentioned? I feel like we've done it all. We've done it all. Yeah. yeah, I think so. We've talked about every reliever in my relief pitcher tiers. So those are the only ones I care about, Frank. All right. Well, we're going to wrap there. For Scott and Chris, I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.